right, there are other geophysical um, surveys that we can use when we're uh, doing remote sensing. We can also look at magnetic surveys. Magnetic surveys work on ore deposits that have a lot of magnetic minerals in them. For example, those volcanogenic massive sulfide deposits, they often have more uh, magnetic minerals than others. And so you can, um, you can actually measure that. You can see that on a magnetic survey. And this is just a magnetic survey of the Albuquerque Basin. And uh, we're not really seeing any ore deposits on here, but for example, here, notice how that looks different from the surrounding areas. Those are some buried lava flows. And basaltic lava also usually has a lot of or more magnetic minerals than other things. So even though they're underneath uh, some younger sedimentary uh, sequences, we can still see them because of the magnetics there. You can also see this straight line right here. That's a pipeline. It's uh, metal, and so that pops up magnetic. And I, I also like how you can see these little dots there. Those are landfills. Um, and these landfills, of course, have old washing machines and refrigerators and other metallic stuff in there, so they pop up on the uh, magnetic survey as well. But in any case, if we had an ore deposit that was uh, very magnetic, it would show up something like these things. Um, radiometric surveys, these measure radiation from elements like uranium, thorium, and potassium. And uh, radiometric surveys had been uh, used in the past looking for uranium deposits. Uh, but there is another type of uh, ore deposit we didn't go over. Uh, this is iron ore, copper, gold. And that usually has a little bit of elevated radiation as well. And so a radiometric survey might not be bad for something like that. Um, so we do this remote sensing and that helps us narrow down where we really want to look for our ore deposit. But eventually you have to get in the field. You have to be there and actually look at those rocks and sample them and, and map out where the different rock types are. And when you're there in the field, you're going to look at the geochemistry of the area. And this is going to be, you'll collect samples and you'll look at what elements are in those samples. Basically, is there enough concentrated, whatever mineral you're looking for, is enough of it concentrated in these rocks to make it economic to develop a mine there? And uh, you might sample um, stream and lake sediment. Uh, and what would this do? Well, the stream and lake sediment might be uh, enriched in whatever mineral you're looking for. And this would then tell you, well, if it's enriched in that, this sediment came from upstream. If I want to find that ore deposit, let me start going upstream looking for it. We can also look at what's known as overburden or soil geochemistry. Overburden is basically like the sediment or the soil that's covering an area. And if you remember from soils, soil forms in place. So if we uh, look at the soil chemistry and it is enriched in whatever commodity we're looking for, well, where'd that come from? It came from the rock underneath it. And uh, this is a gold in soil map from a location in Newfoundland. And uh, what they were doing, they sampled um, soil all across these areas and uh, then mapped out where the maximum amount of gold in the soil was. And most of it was here in this area. And um, that's indeed where the bedrock that's enriched in gold is located. Now in some areas, botany actually helps when exploring. And uh, this is really kind of neat in, um, uh, this is especially true of some regions in Africa. Certain plants grow where there's more copper in the soil. And one of these plants is this one. This is in Zambia, that's Bessium omblai. 
and it loves to grow in soil rich in copper. So if you're doing copper exploration in Africa, look for Bessium omni because that tells you you are sitting on top of enriched, at least the soil is enriched in copper. Um, or if you're in Zaire, you might want to look at Katagensi here, uh, another flower that absolutely loves growing in soil enriched in copper. And again, that soil got that copper from the bedrock that it uh, developed on. So you, this would be a good clue that you want to check out that area. Now, of course, eventually we also just want to sample some of the rocks. And so we will take samples of those from the surface, but also when we go drilling to get that three-dimensional image of our ore deposit, we, we will assay, we'll test some of the sections, some of the areas of that drill core, and, um, and see does it have uh, enough of our mineral that it would make mining it economic. So we undergo all of these sorts of things and we finally come up with this nice three-dimensional view of an ore deposit and your exploration geologist will basically uh, calculate how much ore is in the ground and how much um, uh, how rich the ore is and they'll kind of figure out what its value would be but then we have to think of something else and so now we kind of know how much money could we sell this ore deposit for you know and we're extracting it but we have to think of a few other things before we can decide if this is going to be economic. We have to think about the mine design. And different ways of mining have different prices to them, right? And there's going to be a cost to developing the mine, and then there's going to be what we call continuing costs. Uh, you know, you, uh, you have to pay your workforce, you have to do repairs on equipment. Those are continuing costs. Um, you want to also look at the mineral processing. You know, when we mine some rock out of the ground, it's not instantly ready to turn into an iPhone, right? You have to extract some of the different elements and things that are in there. And depending what you have to do in that processing, it's going to cost more or less money. And so you have to take a look at that. And then you also have to look at reclamation because in uh, many countries, not all of them, but in many countries, um, you are required to reclaim the land after mining. In fact, in the U.S., before you uh, develop a mining uh, uh, property, you have to post a bond. Uh, basically, you have to pay for the cleanup costs in advance. And this is basically to make sure that people actually clean up so they don't, can't just walk away and be like, oh, no, we went bankrupt. You know, they, they pay for the cleanup in advance with this bond. And you have to see how much that's going to cost. You're going to have to look at what are the taxes going to be where you're developing your mine. How much are we going to have to pay the workers? Because in different places, there are different uh, expectations for pay. Uh, you have to pay workers in the United States a whole lot more money than you have to pay them in South Africa. And uh, so you want to see what that cost is going to be. There's, of course, going to be legal costs. There are always legal costs because uh, opening a mine in the U.S. today basically means you're going to be in court for the rest of the mine's life and uh, there will always be people who don't want it open and uh, so you're going to have to just um, uh, count on the fact you're going to have to spend money uh, defending your project. Uh, then there's going to be price forecasts. We're going to look at how much is my commodity going to be selling for, not just now, but also in the future over the lifetime of my mine. And that's the next part. What is my projected lifetime of the mine going to be? So what we do in, in our exploration, uh, we end up figuring out how big our ore deposit is, how uh, rich it is, and basically how much money it would be worth. And then during this appraisal or feasibility part of, of figuring out whether we want to pursue this project, we look at what are the costs going to be to develop this. And are the costs going to be so much 
that it makes the project not worth it. Or after looking at how much it costs and looking at how much our ore deposit is worth, maybe it is going to make us money and then we will pursue that. Um, so that's a lot of um, considerations that have to go into whether we're going to develop a new uh, mining location or not. Now, when we talk about mining methods, I said uh, that was one of the things we have to think about, right? Mine design. What kind of mine are we going to have? Um, there's three very classic, basic ways of extracting our important um, minerals. Uh, underground mine. This is what most people picture when we talk about mining. And this is used for concentrated ore deposits. So if your ore deposits are like in a vein or in a very specific location, you might use this. And uh, there's a good old fashioned look at um, underground mining in the past. Would have been lit by candles. This is how you would drill in the past. That's a drill steel. You'd have two of your buddies pounding on the end of it and slowly turn it to drill into the rock um, in order to uh, set it up for blasting. Uh, these days we have a lot better, um, you know, we, we have, it's, it's mechanized now. The drills work a lot faster and we have better lighting too. Uh, but anyway, in underground ore deposits or underground mining, uh, you enter the mine either through an adit, which is basically like this sort of tunnel into the side of, of a hill, or you can go in through a shaft, which we're going from the surface downwards. This is an adit at uh, a mine where I used to do some work. This is what it can look like underground. That's where my husband used to work. This is a shaft house. So this is sitting on the surface and it's basically kind of like a, a elevator, right? It's going to lower miners into the ground and take them back out at the end of the day. And it's also going to have the equipment in there for pulling the ore out of the ground. And this is an old um, mine plan from 1849 where we see a shaft there, we see an adit here, and this shows you that mines often have many different levels. So as we extract all the ore out of here, we then work our way downwards and keep working our way downwards through the thickness of the ore deposit. But let me show you a little fun thing with a modern underground mine. So this is down in Argentina. And this was a historic silver mine. It had a couple of shafts and a few levels. These are the modern mines. And you see this like little squiggly things right here? That's actually how the miners get down into, uh, into the mining area. This is a spiral ramp. You know when you go to the airport and you go uh, into the parking garage and you go up the, like, the, the circular little drive to get up or down out of the parking garage. That's kind of like that. One of these is basically this spiral ramp that takes that you follow going down and then the other is the spiral ramp bringing you back to the surface and they'll be driving big trucks down there down to the appropriate level, load it up and then come back to the surface. But when you're underground, sometimes you have to secure things so um, we don't have collapses. And you, just like when we went over mass movements, I, I don't know, it seems like months ago now, uh, you can use these bolts to bolt rock layers together. You can do the same thing in mines. Um, and you see some in place right there. So that's underground mining. Another method that we can use is open pit mining. And this is used for disseminated ore deposits. So when you have um, the valuable minerals scattered through a very, very large volume of rock, you would use the open pit method. This is a smaller open pit. This is an iron mine. Um, and uh, you can see the dimensions about a mile and a half across and about a mile wide, about uh, a little over 900 feet deep. And that's what it looked like. That's the kind of trucks they drive there. That's one of the classes I, uh, I took there on a field trip. Uh, wish I could do that with you guys. Uh, but that's uh, one of the trucks they, uh, they use to haul ore at that location. 
Now the last type of mining is called strip mining. And strip mining is used for ore deposits that are very shallow and close to the surface and are horizontal, right? That are parallel to the surface. And this is used almost exclusively for coal. Coal is a sedimentary rock, and so sometimes you get these layers of coal that are just a few feet or a few tens of feet beneath the surface, and then you'll use this method called strip mining. So what happens in strip mining, we basically remove the topsoil and the overburden, then scrape away the layer of coal. See right there, that black is the layer of coal. And then as the coal is removed, we then put back the overburden and then reclaim, basically put back topsoil and plant all the plants. Uh, and this, this will progress across an area. Remove all the stuff, scrape the coal away, and then put all the stuff back and restore the surface. And like I said, that's really not used for many kind of things other than coal. All right, so in the mining process, what we, uh, what we do is um, we drill. So now we're at the point where we've decided we're gonna open this mine, we're gonna make money getting this stuff out of the ground, and uh, so now we have to get it out of the ground. Um, so we're drilling right there. We're not drilling for oil or something. We're drilling holes. See all those little holes right along there? See these trucks? They're going to fill those holes with explosives. And then it's going to go boom. And we're going to have all this broken up rock now that's much easier to move around. And so they're going to load that broken up rock into this, uh, this big truck. And they're going to haul it off for processing. And in processing, what we're doing is we're going to separate the valuable material from the stuff that's not valuable, right? And so we're going to separate all the stuff we need from the stuff that we can't make money off of. So how do we process minerals? Now, this is not a list. So it's not like first we do this, next we do this. This is more a list of options. Like we might do crushing, we might do something else. It depends on what we're trying to extract. And uh, so those big rocks that, that got uh, uh, blasted apart, they're gonna be crushed first. They're more manageable. Then in many cases, you will grind these down to a very small, a very fine powder, like about 0.2 millimeters. And, um, and that's what's often done, is grind down the, uh, the ore to that. And what we're seeing here, uh, these are ball mills where they're grinding down the rock. These rotate around and uh, inside there you put the rocks that have been crushed and uh, there's a bunch of like big steel balls and it grinds down the, um, the material. It's really loud in there. Now, after that, you might do flotation, which I've always thought was so fascinating. So what happens is um, you get this big tank of water and you put a solution in there, you put a chemical in there, and, um, and you create bubbles in this tank. And then you add your ground up rock, your ground up ore. And the material you're looking for will stick to the bubbles. So even if you have a heavy material like copper, because of the chemistry of the solution, the heavy material like the copper is gonna stick to the bubbles and bubbles float to the surface. And so what then happens when the bubbles float to the surface, they kind of pour over the side of the tank and we then have concentrated whatever it is we're looking for. I use the example of copper right there because it's just the copper that's sticking to the bubbles and all the other stuff won't stick to the bubbles so it stays at the bottom of the tank. And so this, the valuable material kind of floats up in here and then spills over the side. And that's a way that we can separate the good mineral from the worthless mineral. And like I said, I always thought that was really cool. And so uh, basically this forms something that we call concentrate. Now, um, what might happen 
uh, also in processing is you might do smelting, which is one of the oldest forms of extracting uh, valuable materials. And basically in smelting, you grind up the rock and you then heat it up really, really hot and melt everything. And when the rock melts, you're going to get uh, the valuable material and the what's called slag, which is not valuable, separating from each other. So for example, if you grind up copper rich uh, material and melt it, you're going to end up uh, basically um, the, the slag is going to be less dense. It's going to kind of float and the, the native pure copper is going to stick at the bottom and you can just pour off the bad stuff and then you're left with, uh, with your pure metal. And so that is a, a, a form of processing that's been in existence for thousands and thousands of years ever since the Calcolithic or Copper Age.